Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of your Friendly Ex Muslim podcast. I have two really special guests today. And just to give you a little bit of background, I was on Myth Vision podcast last week and we had a phenomenal discussion, uh, which is hosted by Derek Lambert. Derek is the, the owner of the channel and his channel focuses all on the myth in the Bible and, you know, the finding out like was this story where did the story come from where's the evidence that the story you know where's the history of the story and all of that stuff Derek also has a very good friend uh dr josh who is a scholar of assyriology as he's a assyriologist and he has uh, a lot of background in this topic in particular in the near east ancient near east so i'm going to add them both to the show and uh we'll start with Derek. Derek, how's it going What's up, man? Thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No way. So in, in 30 seconds, um, how would you describe what what myth vision is about? Did I kind of get it right? A little bit off there? Um, you're asking me to walk on water is what you're asking me to do. And I don't know if that's even possible. No, you got it right. You hit it. You hit the nail right on the head. Um, you know, there's that little statement by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Who is your daddy? And what does he do? Right. I always want to find out who's the daddy of the baby, which is the story. And then when you yeah. find out the daddy's this yeah. uh, Mesopotamia, whatever, then you go, uh, well, who's the daddy of that story? And so you yeah. find out these stories are not historically unique in, in, in com like completely. So there's so much to it, man. There's way more to this. And Dr. Josh is the guy oh, wrong way. He's the guy right here that you really, he's got the credentials and he, he knows his stuff. So awesome. Awesome. So, uh, before we jump to Dr. Josh, I want to ask you a little bit about your religious background. So where are you now? Where did you start and where are you now? Talking to me? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, wow. you specific before we jump to Dr. Josh, okay, okay. where did you start? <clears throat> like where, like how, because I, I know a little bit, you told me a little bit about your background, but I want you to tell the viewers as well. Where are you now on the faith spectrum? Like uh, where did you start and where did you end up? I started off typical, you know, Christian uh, at a Baptist church in some form of Baptist, if you will, and then became really devout through my uh, late teen years when I started to get some struggles, you know, traumas in life start to catch up with you. So I took Christianity as serious as you probably possibly can as a Christian. Um, uh, radical Muslims, if you will, would equate to the idea of like how serious they really are about the text, how serious they are, are trying to be at least. That's how I was about Christianity. And as I got into it, uh, let's just put it this way. The more I learned about it and the more troubles in life, I started to be able to evaluate my own faith critically, that's when I ended up coming to a position where God was kind of pantheistic, bigger, broader. Now I'm an atheist. I, I don't posit that there must be a deity or I think there is one. There could potentially be one, but I don't have any reason to, to suspect that. So I'm now an atheist. Oh, yeah. So um, it's interesting how when we when I talk to people from different religions, that also ended up atheists, how much overlap there is between our stories. In a lot of a lot of cases, it tends to be the ones that were the most religious. Like I find a lot of my fellow YouTubers are like former fundamentalists, people that were so determined and so religious at that. And then when they had the break, things just, you know, fell apart. You know, it, it sounds it sounds negative because for a lot of people, it is negative. It is falling apart. Like everything just falls apart because you weren't expecting this to happen. And now you need a new paradigm mm -hmm. and you can't be reborn be without dying first. So that's, that's kind of like, you know, it, it, there's a lot of negativity there. The experience is actually really tough for most people, especially when you're, you know, that fundamentalist, that religious, because all your friends, all your family members, everything around you is, is in context of your religious um, beliefs basically, right? Like the your whole world view is is shaped and formed by this this religious text and the community and all that. And so when you leave it, you know, there's obviously a lot of sacrifice involved. And it's amazing how you know a former Christian can have the same, almost the same experience as a former Muslim. Now, depending on where you are in the world, depending on your family members, it would be a lot worse for a former Muslim if they're in a Muslim country because the laws can be very, very against you know it's actually illegal 
could be actually illegal to leave Islam. So that that could be a unique sort of negative. But in terms of the family experience, especially growing up in Canada or America, a lot of the times the former Muslims, they're not facing death usually. It's more like family issues, you know, family. If the a, a woman, they may have to fake the hijab. Again, maybe something unique to Islam. But even then, you'd have Christians that would have to pretend, you know, sometimes living with parents, they'd have to fake it till you can kind of get out on your own. So that's, that's, the, that's the interesting thing. And that's why I like talking to former believers from other religions because there's just so much in common, right? Um, so that's 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 why this is I think this is so valuable. And of course, you know, the there is a segment of uh, people that watch ex-Muslim channels that are very into their own religion, but they don't like Islam, which to me is funny because they suffer from a lot of the same problems. And it's 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 funny to see someone coming and cheering you on while they themselves also have you know, so so that's something that we want to fix, right? We want it to be like you know, we want to put all of these on the same playing field. We and the the myth part is such an interesting aspect to me as well. So I'm going on and on now. <laughs> I haven't even got to Dr. Josh yet. Uh, but the myth part is so interesting to me because that is where a lot of this falls apart. When you start to see where the stories came from, how this these stories are not unique, but they're actually you know they they've evolved right, just like organisms. They evolve through time and they change right. They hit a specific junction. Like in Christianity, they where they, when they came from maybe Zoroastrianism or something, they end up in Judaism. Then they end up in Christianity. They've changed again, and then they end up in Islam. And every time there's like a little bit of a change, like Gog and Magog, Gog from Magog. I remember learning this. I was like, it, it was a guy from a tribe, and then it became two tribes. And then in the Quran, it's like this horde of creatures that's gonna come at the end of time. So, anyways, that's I'm I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. So let me let me get to you, Doctor Josh. So, Doctor Josh, thank you for joining as well. Um, pleasure to have both of you. Can you tell me a little bit about your background? Uh, we'll start with your academic background, in particular regarding, you know, the Bible, let's say. And you, you said also ancient Near East as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I got my bachelor's degree from a very conservative evangelical school <laughs> called Liberty University uh, in religion. And uh, I went to Capital Bible Seminary, which uh, was another fundamentalist evangelical school where I got a 126 semester hour uh, graduate degree <laughs> in uh, theology where I focused in on the Old Testament. So I, I studied extensively and then taught Hebrew and Aramaic and Ugaritic and Syriac and Akkadian and, you know, all these <laughs> languages that, that wow. deal with the Hebrew Bible. Um, and after that, I went to Johns Hopkins University and I went in as a fundamentalist evangelical Christian, and within the first year, I became uh, an atheist. Uh, but there, I became an Assyriologist. So that just means, you know, studying the languages and cultures of ancient Iraq and Syria. So I, you know, I mastered Sumerian and Akkadian, and then I minored in Hebrew Bible because of my background in it. So, um, you know, I wrote my dissertation on Sumerian. Uh, literary texts and liturgical texts from the early second millennium uh, BCE, but uh, from from Mesopotamia. But uh, you know, my everything that I did uh, included Hebrew Bible, included archaeology. So that that's sort of my background academically. It's a really impressive CV. Uh, God's tomahawk says you guys have no clue what Christianity is. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, we don't. No doubt, no doubt. Cool, 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 cool. I, I, I would agree that, you know, a lot of times I get asked questions like, why don't you, you normally from Muslims, I mean, to be fair, why don't you talk about other religions? And I'm like, how how could I talk with um, confidence about the Bible when I was never Christian? I never, I mean, I read the Bible sort of, like I looked through it. But like, I wouldn't, I, like, I don't, and, and you know, unfortunately, when I, I did have a discussion with Dr. U. Ross, it went really badly for me because whatever he said, I just couldn't counter it. When I'm having a discussion yeah. with a Muslim, it's like, okay, I understand what's going on here. But when, with Dr. U. Ross, all you had to say was, well, in this other verse, it said this. And I was like, I don't even, I've never even heard that. So it was kind of like some, a pointless discussion. I was way outgunned. Mm -hmm. um, so that was unfortunate. Some of, our, some of our earliest videos on the channel were against Hugh Ross's bad interpretations, bad readings of the Hebrew. So like the one thing that sticks out is the stretching out of the heavens. You know, yeah. this is the big bang and bullshit. 
yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not that at all. But. You know, um, so what about the the whole heavens and earth? That that term is in the Bible as well, right? Heavens and earth. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. he he was saying that just means all of existence. From the Quranic perspective, it's clear to me, and from doing research on other ancient cultures, that every single, almost every single ancient culture used to think that there was two entities, heavens and earth. There was the earth, which we live on, and then there's the sky, which is something else. There's just it's flat earth, big thing on top. A lot of times it would be like a dome. Like when you look at some of the ancient paintings, it's like a dome. I mean, if you look at flat earthers, they've yeah. like devolved to like what people thought like, you know, a thousand years ago or something. They're basically like living in that that era, not in the modern era, right? Eh? And um, so this idea to me actually was a big problem in the Quran as well because it doesn't sound like the, the, the creator of the universe is speaking because why would he use language like that, heavens and earth? Because... The Earth is not is not anything special in the sense that it's just one planet among millions. But like from a perspective of an ancient human, you know, the ancient Chinese they talked about you know the this you know the god that pushed up the sky, and there was the ancient most ancient cultures had this concept of heavens and earth. And you know, in modern cosmology, we know it's not heavens and earth anymore. We know it's the universe, and the Earth is one part of it. But the earth is not in the middle of the universe it's not geo we don't have a geocentric model anymore back then it was geocentric flat earth you know so i and i think the bible's genesis as well suffers from the same issues that the quran does would you agree with that go ahead Derek. well <clears throat> simply put <clears throat> this book's not a science book um though this is i think a jab potentially at some cosmology there are some scholars who want to argue that there is some temple ideas going on within the, within Genesis one, and they're not wrong in seeing these these notes that there's some temple motifs. It's very chiastic in Genesis one, uh, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, and then he rests on the seventh. But what I love about Doctor Josh is when you when you look at Genesis one through eleven, this whole. Um, I guess you could call it kind of a prehistory type of the primeval uh, history. Primeval yeah. history, yeah. It's definitely, if I could say, utilizing Mesopotamian uh, narratives, like the Epic of Gilgamesh. I don't care what Christian apologist on planet Earth wants to tell you. Okay, <laughs> they might try to argue this. Why isn't this verb borrowed from the Mesopotamian text? We can't see a literary absolute, you know, Xerox copy of something. You don't need it. Trust me. Dr. Yeah. Josh does plenty of that. And um, so when you're looking at Genesis 1, you're talking about an ancient person who does not have the science we do, just observing the world around them, like you talked about, Abdullah. I mean, it's it's very clear. The world is flat. The earth is the center of everything. We are the center of all creation. I mean, like once you start realizing when science came on the scene that, you know, we're really not the center of the universe. What are we going to do? <laughs> You know what I mean? You start to have a problem. Yeah. There's a problem here because we have always thought we're the most, we're in the image of God, according to the Bible. We're the highest of all things could possibly be. Now, don't get me wrong. We're very intelligent. I don't want to downplay people's personal experience in life to say that they're important and special because we all are. But that doesn't mean, you know, we, we somehow bolster our cosmology, attach it to the Bible and say the Bible's true because of my experience. And that's what you're going to find happening with most Christians. They've had an experience of some sort and they just took super glue in their mind. It automatically happens. They don't intentionally do this. They took the super glue in their brain and attached it to the, to the book, to the text, to the story, to whatever the myth is that they're being told, whatever culture, if you're out in Asia, you're probably going to become a Buddhist or something. If you're in the middle East, you're probably going to become a Muslim in the current context or a Christian or a Jew or something depending on where you're raised and what you're told. It's really simple. But anyway, I've rabbit trailed off of Genesis, but if you want Dr. Josh, take, what is Genesis doing? Yeah. I mean, so to be clear, and I think this is something that we, you know, we need to be sensitive to people, people in the ancient world had a cosmology, like Abdullah was saying, and uh, that doesn't make them dumb. It doesn't make them, you know, like less intellectually, it make them intellectually inferior or something. 
this is just what they had and what they were working with. And so the way that ancient Near Eastern cosmology functioned was you had essentially heaven and earth and, you know, the heavens that, that the Rakia, you know, as it's called in Genesis one, that dome like structure up there, you know, the, the way the Mesopotamians sort of pictured this, it was made of a certain type of stone. And then there was a certain layer above that, uh, that was made of a different kind of stone. You know, so you had you had regions of heaven up there. Then you had the space in between. Uh, then you had the earth, and then you had the subterranean waters, where you know the sweet waters down below. And so, when you look at how the the, the biblical text put this together, you've got the dome up there. Above that are the waters, and then God. Uh, then the space in between, you know, sort of Middle Earth where we live, and then underneath you have um, you know the the deep waters, and you you see this sort of thing in the flood, but. Um, so I think the problem that people like Hugh Ross have is they're, they're seeing, they're trying to come at the, the biblical text, particularly the Hebrew Bible and say, this is an inspired and inerrant text. And because of that, we can't have unscientific things or, you know, scientific aspects of this that are, um, that are inaccurate. And so what we do is we use a modern lens and look at, you know, things like mm -hmm. in Genesis 1, 1, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, ah, heavens and the earth, this is like a merism. So it means everything. Well, that's true in a certain sense. It means everything because what they conceived of everything is the heavens up there and the earth down here. This is, this is all there is, but what they, so in that sense, you could translate that universe in a very, very restricted sense. I wouldn't, but you could, I suppose. Yeah, he. What he's but saying then, in that, if you don't mind, is that he, these guys yeah. aren't imagining nebulas in far galaxies. Okay, that's exactly. This is right. not on the right. In fact, stars are little lights in the sky. They're not even. Sometimes they're deities, depending on the, the ancient Near Eastern context. But I just had to make that point because. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like, there's a certain nuance of the word universe where it just sort of means like everything that exists. But from a more scientific, modern perspective, then they they translate it universe. And then they say, well, that must mean universe in the sense that we, so all the, you know, every big bang cosmology, all this stuff can get read right into it. And it's just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not the case. They do that with evolution. Like evolution's mm -hmm. now coming on the scene. A lot of these guys have to be scientific in their mind. So they yeah. have to adopt evolution and incorporate it into their, their cosmology. So they go, well, you know, a day, is it? It's not 24 yeah. hours. This is a, a long period of time between day one, day two, day three. Can't you see it? I mean, life arose out of the water. He separates the water from the waters, the land from the water. And, like, <laughs> and they come up with these wild, convoluted, yeah. irrelevant to their original context interpretations. But yeah. what modern believer of any of these isn't doing that with the text already? They do it with not just Genesis. Like even a lot of the passages that they quote as their own scripture – they divorce it from its original context and what it actually meant. So it's the reader's interpretation that counts. Yeah. It isn't, it doesn't matter what it was originally written for. We want to know what it really meant when it was written. And we, we're interested in hearing how these people interpret it, sure. but it's like, just so we can go, <laughs> wow, humans are creative. Like you made that shit up right now. You know what I mean? Like that's our whole intention. Yeah. I'm going to say, uh, I want to say a couple of things. So I think the reason why people try to put um, science into the, the Quran and Bible is because, at least for me, when I was a former Muslim, to me, that reaffirmed my faith in the Quran that this book has, because, you know, I'm assuming, okay, this is truly from God. So therefore it has not only has no mistakes, but it should have some sort of confirmation that this is from a deity outside of the experience of human knowledge. So that's that to me would be a, like a strong confirmation. And you know, this was a narrative that was very popular in the nineties among Muslims at the scientific miracles in the Quran. And they would bring up things like this. Um, so modern, like com nowadays, a lot of the da'is and the scholars and the preachers, they, they want to go the opposite direction now. And they want to say, they want to step away from this because it's causing more problems. But this idea of like scientific miracles, I don't think it's unreasonable for someone that's a believer or anyone that's looking for God's communication to expect that God's communication would actually contain some sort of confirmation that this is truly not from a human, not from a human being, because if it was from a human being, 
and and you know it, with the Quran specifically, it's meant to be God's final word, and it's meant to cancel out all the previous revelations. So there's no more messengers. Muhammad was the last messenger. So all you have is this book. So this book needs to be able to stand the test of time, and but it doesn't. That's the problem. It doesn't. It falls apart. Um, I want to share actually my screen and show you some interesting um, some interesting quotes from the Quran, which are quite similar to what you've been you've been saying in another verse in the quran it says these chase the devils the shooting stars chase the devils <laughs> and again it talks about seven heavens and we are doing the nearest one with lamps with lights right and here's the one i was talking about where it chases the devils now what i found interesting in what you said dr josh was when you talked about the firmament this mm -hmm. like solid structure the quran doesn't actually mention that it's solid but it hints at it and again, this was something I found, which which I found really interesting. Um, let me let me show you an example. So he created the seven firmaments, seven heavens in two days, and he adorned the lowest one with lights. So in 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 another one, which I don't have it here, it says that that when you look at the at the sky, the firmament, you don't see any flaws in it, meaning it's like a solid structure, and Allah is the one that holds it up without any pillars that you can see does this sound familiar to what some of the things you've been saying in the bible from the bible yeah i mean i think um the the way that the specific um way that the cosmology was viewed is often uh, subject to a bit of interpretation um but i mean there's no question that there are pillars that hold up the earth right there's a in, in other words it's it's viewed in almost exactly the same way, if not the same way uh, as it was viewed in the rest of the ancient Near East. And so we have things like the Babylonian map of the world. And if you're familiar with that I mean, cuneiform tablet, it, it depicts, uh, you know, Babylon and Babylonia as the center of the, the world. And then sort of amongst other things, there's like a mountain here, and other, but then there's like the, the sea all around and uh, then there are these these points that are uh, along the outside that are like these sort of, I don't know, mythological, far away places. They're called Nagu. And uh, like the flood survivor, Utnapishtim, he lives out on one of these. But it, again, it's it's pictured as just this flat, you know, there's there's no there's no, uh, you know, global aspect to it. Um, and then above it is being held up by, you know, uh, whatever is, whatever. So there are different ideas about what's holding up that dome, but, um, at its ends. And so, so that type of cosmology foundations, pillars underneath the earth itself being flat and then something, some type of pillars, some structures, even, even some type of being, uh, holding up that dome area above which the gods live and that there's, you know, generally water pictured up there because, uh, you know, I think for, uh, in Genesis, obvious reasons, but, um, yeah, that there's, there's a lot of similarity. I think just generally speaking in the ancient Near Eastern idea of, of, of um, you know, cosmic geography. Yeah. And I, I do think I, 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 I missed that point you made earlier about how we're not like looking down on the people that had this ancient cosmology. Of course not. In fact, the how we got to where we are today is standing on the shoulders of giants. Like humanity has been moving forward every, you know, with every generation by building on the, the previous model. And science is it's, it's basically a model. Like cosmology is a model. It's never going to be perfect. It's we're going to have to gradually and, you know, incrementally improve it. Right. For example, you know, when I forget who was um, Plato, someone was looking at the stars and, you know, they noticed some issues with the um, with the way that the moon was moving and then they adjusted the model. So we have we have better and better models that over time have actually more accurate, accurately represented like the seven spheres, you know, everything going around the earth. There's problems with that model because it, you know, the the one of the ancient uh, cosmologists noticed the, the planet was going back and forth, which doesn't make any sense, right? In that model, mm -hmm. then he realized that, oh, okay, this is actually no, not not going around, you know, the, the moon is actually going around the earth, but the earth is going around the sun. So they, they managed to figure it out. And that's that's a great thing. What I've noticed about Islam in particular, I don't know if it's true about the, the Bible as well, is that there were Greek 
um, philosophers and scientists that actually knew better. They knew that they they were indicating things like there wasn't a flat Earth. They were figure the Plato said the Earth is like a ball decked with different layers, and like he actually mentioned, it's like a ball. Whereas the Quran, which was after that, indicates flat Earth, right? Like it it hints at a flat Earth. It talks about the Earth being spread out. I mean, spread out is not a ball. It's flat, like a carpet, right? Like a bed. It's it compares it to a bed. So there were pockets of knowledge in the world, but they hadn't reached necessarily that where the authors of these books were. I don't know if that you would agree with that on the Bible as well. Do we find the same thing, Doctor Josh? Sure. Oh, I'll just I'll make a statement. I'll make a statement, then I want Josh to actually answer this one because. I could do this, but this is coming from him. So if anyone has any problems, I could take it up with him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, um, one thing I liked what you said, Abdullah, in light mm -hmm. of that, as I transition this to Dr. Josh, is we respect the literature and the, and the idea of their cosmology for what it is and needs to stay where it's at. The pro This is what we're trying to yes. do is educate people to go, that's how they believed. Yes. And you know what? For their time, they might have been advanced in the ancient yeah. Near East or let's not use the word advanced maybe. But this was the well-known best observations during their time in the first, second millennium BCE, let's just say. Um, and then Greeks come along like you talked about. There's a man, I think, in the fifth century BC. He puts one stick in one spot. <laughs> he has this other yeah. person in another. And he sees angles of light, which shows yeah. that the Earth has curvature. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, anyway, Dr. Josh, please. Yeah. And hold on about that point. I mean, this to me is the craziest thing about flat earthers. I, I love flat earthers because they're just like so like flat earthers tend to bring this narrative that it's a modern NASA agenda to say the earth is round. But when you go to ancient world, there are people putting sticks, like, you know, scientists that put sticks and figured out back then they would look at the, the horizon and they would see the, the little ship, how it's hidden. And as it goes, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that doesn't make sense on a flat earth. Well, they were you Illuminati then too. Just remember. <laughs> yeah, obviously. You know what I mean? They were all part of this thing. They've had it planned since 25, 2700 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my favorite go-to with people that say it's a NASA thing is go back and look at the, uh, even on Wikipedia, the, the, the round earth article, it shows beautifully how humans gradually got to this idea of a round of a globe. It's just amazing. Sorry, Dr. Josh, go ahead. I just had to put my dig against flat again. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think Derek said it well. Um, I think that when we come to this sort of fundamentalist approach to ancient text, what be it, you know, wh whatever religion it is, uh, when you have this more fundamentalist approach, which tends to come with reading very literalistically, um, trying to remain in their, uh, you know, uh, ideas of things like cosmology or science, and then try to make them sort of fit with modern understandings, I think is, it obviously is incredibly problematic. And what it does is I think it, it does grave injustice to um, maybe the, the better ways that we could utilize the text. And I'll give an example that I don't think will be controversial for anybody. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an amazing story. It's very well crafted. Um, Sin Lake Unini, the, 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 the you know, editor of the scribe that put it together uh, ostensibly, like he's, he's taking older Sumerian stories uh, and probably Akkadian stories about Gilgamesh and some of his exploits, Gilgamesh and the Bull of Heaven, Gilgamesh and Huawa, you know, and bringing these bringing these stories together into this longer, uh, you know, coherent epic and doing so in such a way that he's, he's, he's making it greater than the sum of its parts. And in doing so, like if we were to, if, if anybody's read, you know, hasn't read the Epic of Gilgamesh, I'd obviously, you know, recommend that you go do it. We read it on our channel. Um, but digital Hammurabi mm -hmm, on digital. I forgot, to, I forgot to mention that. Yes. Yeah, so Dr. Josh has a channel he runs with his wife called digital Hammurabi. Uh, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what the channel is and then continue? Yeah, on absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. you know, since we're both, you know, she's also an Assyriologist from Johns Hopkins. So because we have this background in the ancient Near East, uh, the whole point of the channel is to go through 
the ancient world, whether it be economic things or administrative things or literary things, anything that has to do with the languages and cultures of the ancient Near East, ancient Mesopotamia in particular, we try to present them in an interesting, exciting, and palatable fashion for people that are non-specialists, you know, that, but that are interested in that. So, um, you know, going through, for example, these ancient literary texts that are in Sumerian or in Akkadian, uh, that's, that's what we want to do and show how they're beautiful pieces of literature uh, and that you can get today like anything else. Uh, you can you can glean, I think, phenomenal lessons from them, but you do it in a way that you you look at it through the lens of um, your modern interpretation, understanding that you can't just take everything that they say and run with it. So like with the Epic of Gilgamesh, it would be foolish to read through it and say, oh, well, there must be a tunnel somewhere that you can run through really fast and beat the sun in a race and get to... <laughs> the end of the earth where there's waters of death. And if you cross over them, you can find the ancient flood survivor. Well, no, <laughs> strike that. You know, you don't think that way. Um, the, what is the lesson that the Epic of Gilgamesh is teaching? And the Epic, the Epic is, is going to great lengths to say, you, you, you see this king who's very brash and, and sort of foolhardy in his, in his uh, you know, earlier days. And then it does all these sort of really risky, crazy exploits to try to establish his name, but then his companion dies and all of a sudden he realizes his own mortality. And so then he goes on this long journey to figure out how it is that he can gain eternal life only to realize that he can't. And so he sort of returns back to the beginning saying, I need to, I need to make my name known. And that's the way that I'm going to live on, uh, in the future. And that's a beautiful message. I think that we can pull things from, but that's not a text that you need to open up and study in the sense of saying, right, how do we figure out the, the world around us scientifically? No, you know, or, whatever or it is that they thought. Me? Yeah, exactly. How is this absolutely directly yeah. talking? Because once again, we're the center of everything. Yeah. We can't, you know, get that. It's all about us. It doesn't yeah. matter if uh, you read, let's say, in the New Testament where Paul says, I'm sending Timothy to you. Timothy's heading. You, no Christian reads that and goes, "Hey, Timothy will be at my house any day." They understand that context referred to the first century, but all the other stuff they find a way to. Yeah. Well, that meant that was meant for me. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some stuff that's across the board, like what Doctor Josh is talking about. Um, mortality. We all experience this and all can empathize and relate to those things. But <clears throat> you don't read the Epic of Gilgamesh, trying to go, "How does this apply to me?" The same way Christians will say, well, the Old Testament's the Old Testament, which I, I look forward to getting into some of the ugly stuff in the Bible because I think. <laughs> yeah, so, I think, yeah, I, I got a little bit distracted with the whole science angle because yeah. to me, it was like a big part of my journey. What I wanted to, um, I want to say two things. One is, Derek, you made an amazing point about, you know, putting things in a place. So when we look, so this is something I want to highlight. When we read these ancient, and Dr. Josh was saying the same thing, when we read these ancient texts, we don't think that these are sources of truth on how to become immortal or, you know, this special tunnel, like you said, in the story of Gilgamesh. We don't we don't see it like that. We see it as what it is. But when it comes to our religious books, suddenly we have now uh, epistemology is this is now a source of truth. We put this book at the top of the truth spectrum mm -hmm. above yeah. even observable evidence for some people right? And so now what you've done is you've elevated these books to the the sort of to the, to the position where they, they don't deserve to be. If each book, you know, was treated as, you know, with skepticism and we look and see what makes sense from it. Um, you know, for example, there's there's a guy in the chat, um, Rilo, who keeps putting quotes on the Bible. You know, there's some good things in the Bible too. Nobody's saying the Bible's yeah. all bad. There's a lot of beautiful things in the Bible and the Quran, <laughs> but you have to take it as any other source of truth claim. Like it, you have to evaluate it on an equal basis. If you do the super glue thing that Derek said, where you take your religious experience and you project that onto your religious text, and now you say, now this religious text has to be true, that's wrong. And I've seen Muslims do that too. And I've I even heard of people that take, for example, I mean, I tried shrooms once, I didn't have this experience, but I, I know someone that he told me he took shrooms and this made him a believer again, which was mm -hmm. kind of weird to me because that's, I don't I guess everyone has a different experience, but somehow, 
I don't I don't know. Like it it fired off something in his brain, and now suddenly the Quran is a word of God. I mean, I I don't totally understand how that happened. I was a little bit scared to try it because I thought, what if I become a believer too? It doesn't do that. <laughs> if you might, if I'm if if I may, uh, yeah. Rilo Rilo. Yes. Lots of, you know, I, not to interrupt anyone, but there are, we're going to get into some reference, my friend, just, just, yeah. just, it's just one second and you'll see yeah. what we're talking about. And it, you probably won't accept anything we say based on what I'm seeing, how you're writing. That's perfectly fine. I think cognitive dissonance might, set, I hope it doesn't, but it might set in because if you were anything like me, you're not going to listen to a thing I have to say today. And that's okay. Cause we're all at different points in our life and you can believe whatever you want to believe. But when we point out some of these things today, I hope most of your audience today, Abdullah, will pay attention and go, you know, I'm glad that's not today. I'm glad we're not living that way today. I'm glad society is more moral than what is in the Bible. And many people will accept that, but not in Jesus, the New Testament. Well, we're going to get into that too. Yeah. We're going to show you that either, and this is the thing we're going to have to get into, Abdullah, is that either God does not know the future or... God is like evolving with man, open theism, <laughs> yeah. or uh, he doesn't care that much to a point where he wanted to abolish things that we know are horrific today, and they were being permitted, sometimes commanded in the Bible. Not that God just sat back and goes, well, humans are horribly wicked, and I can't interfere with their free will, so they just do really bad things, and it's out of my zone. No, there are times where God commands someone to do things so we're going to get into these things okay so important. let's 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 jump into that then enough on the science let's talk yeah, about let's get into the hot stuff. okay so one thing that kind of blew me away was that you told me the daughter of jaffa how in the bible he had to sacrifice her now when i mentioned this on my channel a few days ago mm -hmm. um people were saying you got it all wrong god you know they brought up abraham and how god doesn't like child sacrifice so maybe tell us i don't know if you want to stir with that story i don't know if anymore. abraham's where you want to go with he doesn't like child sacrifice josh take Probably us not a good into place it. to start yeah i mean so i think it's good to start by saying we have to be able to differentiate between um ancient israelite religion and what the the Hebrew Bible, this late Judean text, is advocating for. Those are very often quite different things. And so uh, an, an example of why that matters might be something like Deuteronomy 32, because we always talk about monotheism, right? And how the Hebrew Bible is, is like moving toward or is perpetuating this, this idea of monotheism uh, or henotheism, whatever. And if you look at Deuteronomy 32, where the text talks about uh, Ale, the like a, a chief Canaanite deity, and Yahweh as ostensibly, it seems like what's behind this text is there are two different deities, right? Ale is Yahweh's father. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like Deuteronomy 32 in its final form is trying to go to great to great lengths to try to make those syncretized and say that Yahweh and Ale are the same. But in doing so, it gives away that originally the idea in ancient Israelite religion was that they were two separate deities, and Ale was Yahweh's father. So being able to distinguish between what is Israelite religion and what the Hebrew Bible is trying to put forward is really important. And the reason that that's important is something like child sacrifice, people will go through, and the, like the book of Leviticus, mm -hmm. and say, look, it's very clear God is against child sacrifice. Yeah, right here. And what yep. I would what I would say, oh, there it is. What I would say is, and that was perfect timing. Um, yeah. what I would say is that the Hebrew Bible in its final Judean edited form is very much against child sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But the reason that they're setting up those prohibitions, and Heath Durell, who wrote his dissertation on this and then published this in in um a book uh, from Eisenbronn's. Uh, child sacrifice in ancient Israel is he he says you don't make laws against things that people aren't doing, right? And so you can look through the biblical text and see that ancient Israelite religion incorporated, probably not to like some high degree, uh, but incorporated 
child sacrifice and not child sacrifice to Baal or to some other deity, but to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize that. And then Derek, you can talk about Jephthah's daughter, but like it's important to, to sort of set that up and recognize it because what the Hebrew Bible is responding to and what ancient Israelite religion, what they practiced, um, they can differ. They often do differ. And it's important to recognize that the reason that's important to recognize is that so often, and I'll shut up, but people want to demonize the Canaanites. For example, you read through the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, you read through the Pentateuch, and you say, oh my gosh, those awful Canaanites, when Joshua goes into the land under the conquest, you know, in the conquest, he has to eradicate all these or drive out all these Canaanites because they're just so, so wicked. They're doing all this child sacrifice. And the reality is that there's probably a pretty even span of Canaanite child sacrifice, and the Israelites were Canaanites. That's mm -hmm. what they were. So the Israelites were more than likely in the same way. I think we have as much evidence for the, the Israelites doing child sacrifice as we do for the Canaanites. And uh, so this whole idea of demonizing and creating this other with the Canaanites, uh, I think is a propagandistic piece that the Hebrew Bible is, is drawing on and utilizing to, to bolster and justify their own, their own position. So if I can, um, what Dr. Josh is talking about is going to be over many fundamentalist heads. They're not concerned with what real history is, real reality is. And Dr. Josh is trying to point out archaeologists uh, such as William Deaver, for example, shows ancient Israelite religion had God had a wife. Mm -hmm. God had an actual wife named Asherah. OK, the Asherah was his wife. And uh, he made a little reference joke when he gave a conference thing. And he says, well, it's OK, because he divorced his wife. And, um, but it's okay. Cause Israel became his property when they divorced and split up. So it's okay. Like it's a joke, but, um, what most of your viewers are probably going to do that I did Abdullah is they're biblical literalist. They need the Bible to say something. So if a Bible makes a reference directly commanding against child sacrifice, then boom, that's all we need is a clear reference. And you know, this is the problem you had with you Ross. So when you actually give a point, He's got three or four other scriptures that they'll run to and they go, see, ha, ha, ha. This actually says, no, this says this. You know why? Because the book is not writing one story. Yeah. In fact, you have in Deuteronomy, for example, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Dr. Josh, before I get into Jephthah's daughter. One place it says you can own an Israelite slave. You can own one of your own countrymen or women. You can own another – it's like in America. Imagine slavery was universal, like a system like it was in the ancient Near East. You can own an American for six years, but you must release them on the seventh. You can't permanently own them the same way you would a chattel slave uh, from another nation, meaning for life. You own them as property. But yeah. then there's an abolishment of that later in the same Bible for those who need another direct statement that says you cannot own an Israelite slave. So it's in a sense, if you want to be literal, it's – a contradiction. What do we do? The Bible contradicts itself. Or you can be a little bit smarter and not have this literalist approach and say, you know, it sounds like in the tradition in ancient Israel, at first they had the idea that you could own slaves that were uh, Israelites. But then at some point they progressed and they said, you know, it's not good that we own our own people. And, and this isn't helping our own nation. I think it's good that we abolish that practice altogether. And you can only own foreigners. <laughs> that's it. So that's that's something that becomes clear in the Bible itself. Now, looking at Jephthah's daughter, we can go to Leviticus 18 and go, see, God's against child sacrifice. OK, this is a perfect example. Judges chapter 11, verse 29 onward. And this is Jephthah. He's going to battle and he says, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mitzvah of Gilead. And from Mitzvah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if thou wilt, this is a horrible translation because it's all old English, but either way, if thou wilt give the Ammonites into my hand, then whoever comes forth from the doors of my house to meet me, when I return victorious from the Ammonites, shall be the Lord's, and I will offer him up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand, and he smote them from Ur to the neighborhood of Mineth, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karamim with a very great slaughter. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came home, 
came to his home at Mitzvah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and dancing. She was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. And when he saw her, he rent his clothes, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I've opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, my father, if you have opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone forth from your mouth. Now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. And she said to her father, let this, things be, th let this thing be done for me. Let me alone, pretty much let me go for two months that I may go and wander on the mountains and be well my virginity, I and my companions. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she depart, departed. And she and her companions and be well to her virginity upon the mountains. And at the end of the two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had made. She'd never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, for four days in the year. Now, I want you to pause for one second and catch something here. If God's so against human sacrifice like that, and that's his child, right? When he made that deal with God, don't you think God could have easily said, no, my friend, you will not do that to your daughter. Or at this last second, yeah. let's pull the Abraham stunt. Ah, yeah. I see you were faithful. I gave them into your hands anyways. But no, <laughs> your daughter's life will not be taken on. No, he burnt her as a burnt sacrifice. No matter how you chop it up, fundamentalists and, and apologists want to argue to try and make it sound like, no, the only thing that was sacrificed was her virginity. She had to remain a virgin the rest of her life or some BS. That's mm -hmm. not what the text says. His vow was the burnt sacrifice. This is why he was so uh, distraught. And, and whether this is historically true, yeah. it's reflecting sure. something here that is a reality. Human uh, I, offerings to God. Let me ask one question. Like, how does this make sense that I will sacrifice whoever walks in my tent? Like, okay, how is that a sacrifice? It's like, I'm going to murder the next person that comes to my house. I don't care if it's a mailman. I don't care if it's a neighbor. God... <laughs> You, you get me this job. You know, I need this promotion. Get me this promotion. I'm going to kill the next mofo that walks in my house. <laughs> How is that even a sacrifice? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, you don't even know who it's going to be. It could be some, like, some like little kid or something. I mean, which is exactly what happened. It was his That's daughter. exactly like, what happened. How is that a, How is that deal even make sense? And does this not mean that God is a, like, like, like Jehovah is a God of war? Like I heard Ken Armstrong or someone mention that, that this, Jehovah was a, the, a god of war that eventually became the only god. It was jealous of other gods. You know, this god has a personality and jealousy and characteristics. I have to. I have to tell you guys. This <laughs> is Dr. Josh's book. If you want to really do a thorough, and he's, this is just volume one right now. This book right here, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, was just released. It's on Audible. It's on ebook, it's on paperback. And if you are listening to what I'm saying and you really want to know more, even if you don't believe in what I'm saying, I agree, that's fine. I don't care if you agree with me. Read this and I'm telling you, as you go through this book, you will be stuck having to go, slavery? Oh my gosh. And using all the law, like, like, bro, it ain't no, oh, it was just like a job in the ancient world where you go and you <laughs> just need to pay back. There's way more to that. That's part yeah. of it. Don't get me wrong. We're not trying yeah. to straw man. We want to still man the idea, but there's much more. This book, I can I put this up here? I mean, this is like yeah, yeah. So I was gonna I was gonna actually ask uh, Dr. Josh if you want to actually now's a good time to to talk about your book. Um, and the the link to the book is in the description already. So Dr. Josh, you don't you don't need to hold, hold it up. Yeah, uh, no, you, I just, <laughs> bro, I love I'll this. I'll put it on the book. screen. I'll put it on the screen while you uh, while you talk about that. Let me just grab grab the link. Uh, Dr. Josh, you want to just tell us a little bit about the book? Uh, now's yeah, a good time as any. So, so I guess the elevator elevator speech uh, about the book would be so often online, we have exactly what we see here with us in the side chat, right? You have you have atheists or skeptics saying the Old Testament says X about God about Yahweh, and uh, the the Christian generally Christian apologist says, no, 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 that's not what it says. You're, you're misreading that. You don't understand the context. And the example that I always give is 1 Samuel 15, where Saul, uh, who is the king over Israel, is told by God to go wipe out the Amalekites, go to war and wipe out the Amalekites. And it, it's very specific. 
kill men, women, children, infants, like the mm -hmm. suckling infants, cattle, sheep, everything, wipe everybody out down to the infants. And an atheist or a skeptic in these debates will say, how can you serve a God or base your morality on a God who would, uh, you know, call for the genocide of a people down to the very innocent um, babies? And the, what always comes back is, do you know who the Amalekites were? Do you know the context of that passage? And I even see it in the side chat here. Right? <laughs> like somebody's already writing it. So... Um, that question, like, the, who were the Amalekites? And why is it that God is commanding this? Well, the point of the book is twofold. One, it's to give the reader, and it's it's geared toward atheists, but it's great, for, I think it's great for everybody to read. It's, it's the first half of the book gives you the broad background to the Hebrew Bible that everybody needs to engage in these discussions. So chapter one gives you the narrative. What is the story that the Old Testament is actually telling? And it just walks you through it. So volume one walks you through from Genesis one and the creation of the world uh, down to the death of Moses as he's outside. He and the Israelites are outside of the land of Canaan, getting ready to go in and conquer under Joshua. Volume two will pick it up there with the conquest of Joshua and go through until the return of the exiles from uh, from Babylonia. Mm, so you very you, nice. So, so you get the you you know what the narrative is you know what the story is so then chapter two gives you the ancient near eastern history and it walks you through what the history actually was uh in the ancient near east all the way from about 3000 to about 300 bce down near alexander the great um then chapter three goes into archaeology and archaeology how it works what it is that archaeologists do and then what biblical archaeology was like how it's developed and then it gives two uh, test cases, so you can see how archaeology works uh, with the Canaanites and the Philistines. So that those three chapters give you this broad background. Everybody has this background of the ancient Near East. Then the second half of the book, and I'll do it 10 more seconds, uh, covers in detail hot button issues. So the four that are dealt with in volume one are slavery in the Bible. Uh, did Moses write the Pentateuch? Um, was the book of Daniel written early or late? Is it prophecy or history? And then the prophecy against Tyre in Ezekiel 26, does it actually fail? So it's like you get the broad background, then you get into the specific, armed with that broad background, you get into the specific hot button issues um, and you're able to engage with them in a, on a meaningful level. Very nice. Uh, I definitely encourage people that are interested in this topic to check it out and uh, get the book if you can. There's also you. an audio version, which is cool. I love audiobooks. I like listening to things like this in the car. Uh, for those of you who have not liked the stream, do like the stream now. We want YouTube to know this is a good show and share it with other people. So do click on the like button. Thank you so much. And those of you who would like to actually support the channel, feel free to also join it or join me on Patreon. And thank you, Derek, for plugging my uh, Patreon as well. Um, Dr. Josh, so someone, I mean, we're going to have a lot of conversation. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's forget the comments. Let's continue with the topic. We'll, we'll get to comments after. Because well, people you know, gonna... Josh brought up, uh, first, uh, first Samuel 15 mm -hmm. and, and in first Samuel 15, I think is another very powerful problem, uh, about the God of the old Testament. He commands Saul, King Saul in Israel, to go destroy every man, woman, and child of the Amalekites, like everything, including its cattle. Don't keep anything. Saul disobeys. Including the cattle. <laughs> including yeah. the cattle. In fact, when Samuel, the prophet, comes back, Why? you know, he's like, what's that noise? You know, like, uh, I hear cattle. What, what's this? And he's like, oh, we saved those to, to sacrifice them to the Lord. That's not what God commanded. Yeah. Notice the problem isn't oh, you killed little children or you killed women or you killed the men, women, and the children. The problem is, is you didn't do everything that God commanded you to do. Kill everyone. And one of the problems is he didn't even kill the king. So he kept the king and he kept some of the cattle or the, the spoils of the soldiers kept some of the spoils. And this is a big problem I saw um, Rilo bring up. Rilo was saying in the chat, oh, well, they were Nephilim. Like, like every single Amalekite was some like... Uh, there's different people who take different positions on what the Nephilim were, but either way, it's like, well, the children Nephilim deserve to die. 
Like, can you imagine in the 21st century, someone actually believing that someone else's child, because who knows, they might say, hey, I'm a descendant of something like that. You know, the Greeks claim to be descendants, some of them claim to be descendants of the gods. What so, wasn't, um, didn't, doesn't, doesn't it say also keep the virgin women alive? That's in a different passage. This one, okay. it's like annihilate. Uh, wow. Yeah. But like, yeah. even if they were, even if they were aliens, I mean, yeah. what kind of morality is this that you're slaughtering <laughs> aliens, all of them, kill all the aliens, you know, even the little ones, the big ones, the ones with the little, that doesn't, that doesn't sit right with me either. Unless and they weren't. Know, like, I mean, just to, in case it's unclear, like th they weren't Nephilim. <laughs> um, just, just in case anybody's wondering. What a Nephilim! What is that? I never heard this. this so, some sort of creatures or something. So you, they show up in two different passages, um, and the first is the, the most well-known one is in Genesis six. So this is Genesis six one to four. It's this sort of separate story that's brought into the primeval history, and it talks about how. Um, these angelic beings come down and have sex with human women and their offspring uh, become like these sort of divine human mm -hmm. uh, hybrids. Right. And uh, so this is this, this story gets picked up in the book of first Enoch and it gets developed a lot, right. In great detail. There's all this detail about, the angels coming down and they're they're you know talking about it and what the resolve that they have and then all the things that these giants do and anyway um so the flood occurs right god brings about the flood and there are only eight people left and so you would expect right all these half-breed you know divine human they, they're all they're all killed in the flood well in numbers 13 uh, when the Israelites are first sent in, there are 12 spies that are sent in to spy out the land. When they come back and give their report of the land, they bring back news of, you know, oh, it's such a great place. Look, here's all this huge, you know, uh, produce, you know, tremendous produce. And they're the, But the people in here, they're giants, right? And we've even seen uh, the dis like the Nephilim. So we've seen these like half- human half you know divine uh so there's a lot of debate about what that means Are, is it being used sort of like hyper in a hyperbolic way like uh yeah i'm trying to think of a modern day example that we could use but um or is are they actually trying to argue that the, the descendants uh are there and of course if you're if you're arguing for actual nephilim are there you have to figure out how they survived the flood so then you have traditions where there's like a giant that that hangs out on top of the ark, you know, on Noah's ark, and like makes his way, uh, escapes the flood. Right? It's, it's, Are you it's anyway. Wow, this yeah. is like well, next different, level. Yeah, different people yeah. do different things. But what I was going to say in the vein of this is the Philistines also, if one wants to argue the Amalekites are somehow Nephilim and they somehow, I mean, I get why a Christian would want to defend this book, no matter mm -hmm. what, yeah. doesn't matter how ugly you think it is. There's a justified reason why this <laughs> would be okay. Um, in the Philistines, you have Goliath. He is part of this descendancy as well, right? Obviously he's an enemy of Israel, but yeah. are all the Philistines also now reigning in this whole bloodline? And did they all deserve to be annihilated? We can trace historically. So this is where the Bible and history play a role, a role. And this is what I was trying to say about the Greeks before I moved off the subject, because the Greeks claim to be descendants of gods. Are all the Greeks this bad bloodline who deserve to be annihilated and they're not considered men, women, and children now? So I probably have Greek blood in me somewhere, and so does Dr. Josh. We don't know. I'm just saying this. Yeah. Am I not a human now? I mean, this is how absurd the crap yeah. gets. So mm -hmm. when we start making these points that, oh, well, those aren't real humans, okay, say we have to put this particular first Samuel 15 passage to the side because someone thinks that some humans are aliens and some humans are somehow or demon breeds of whatever, which is a horrible worldview. Like who would want to view other humanity this way? The whites used to think blacks were cursed. A lot of racist stuff comes. Oh, we have better bloodline supremacy. I mean, you start to get into that crazy world that no one should be thinking in, in modern context. It's yeah. horrible. So let's go to a different passage. Dr. Josh, what about the humans where it's like, all right, make sure you kill everyone, but save the virgins for ourselves. Yeah. You think that so, looks pretty? I mean, 
Yeah, Before I you mean, jump so in that, can I just can I just say uh, just deal with a few comments? Uh, I think the interesting comments, and I want to. So I uh, that was my point that I hear that it doesn't matter who they were. You know, obviously, genocide of any species would be wrong. But again, if you're making believe now, like I don't know what the rules are anymore for the. You know, if you're like alien, <laughs> I saw you like demon hybrids. Can you kill demon hybrids? Like my morality says, it's okay to do genocide against demon hybrids. That's I mean, my. If you're a Christian rapper, if you're a Christian rapper in the '90s and the 2000s, then yes. It's absolutely necessary. You have to, you have to beat them <laughs> demons over the head with the lead pipe. Um, oh, yeah. I went out the uh, wicked. Here's another funny comment. I thought this was funny because um, YA is obviously Christian, and he's saying <laughs> something which to me is like really ironic. There's no evidence for aliens, <laughs> but he believes in all of these other things without evidence because the bible is evidence apparently i guess now the bible bible itself is not the claim it's now the evidence yeah. right well look i don't want us to mock okay yeah. I, I i i definitely do not want to do that to anyone's beliefs right so i'm open-minded to their other planets having life form of course i mean if we evolved i'm not saying the other humans are out there the complexity involved and in how evolution and natural selection takes place we're getting off topic but my point yeah simply is is i don't want to mock someone's belief what i am trying to do though what i want to do is defang the belief so that they can change and evolve their belief you're going to believe in jesus you believe in god that's okay i'm not against that when i mean like for example dr josh's wonderful wife she believes in god the last person she would kill someone be uh less likely to kill someone before me and dr josh would <laughs> and i say that to say like she would not be okay with these things. She realizes these are old, ancient literary stories. And in those days, this might have seemed normal in the ancient Near East to go slaughter villages of people who were your enemies. That was common. Even Native Americans did this in America. So this happens all throughout the world. That doesn't make it okay. We're trying to point out, you're listening to a book that you claim is holy, and you say it's the message from God, and it's telling these things not just about humans who do things, because that's their cop out. Well, humans do bad things. They're, I mean, didn't you read the Bible? There's, they're horribly wicked. They're desperately wicked. Their heart does wickedness continually, is always, which is the thing that was said right after the flood. God's like, I shouldn't have done this. Oh man, you know, and God, and the man's heart's continually wicked. But that's not what we're painting. We're painting a picture here showing you God's active involvement to command them to do these things. And God is totally like, yes. I want you to go do this to these people. Um, like the mole, like sacrificing the children, right? Yeah. So you have a, a whole tribe that's rolling their babies into the arms of Molech. I've seen the statues, the images, but I don't even know if Molech has been seen as an actual God in the ancient Near no. East, uh, which is a whole different topic, meaning this is a fictional story of a fictional God, but it well, sounds like they're rolling it into the fire. Well, I mean, it's, it's so I, without like, like going into that too, I talk about it in the book. That, that's one of the test cases for archeology. span that we use, but like Heath Durrell and others like Otto Weisfeld um, have argued, and I think probably pretty convincingly, uh, that this this Molech sacrifice, uh, or sorry, a sacrifice to Molech, Molech's not a deity. Molech is a type of sacrifice, like an Olam mm. uh, or an Olah sacrifice, you know, like a whole burnt offering sacrifice. Uh, so because you can have MLK, Molch sacrifices, uh, to uh, different deities, and, even and, Yahweh. Yeah, even Yahweh. So, but I mean, I, I think the the bigger point for me in all of this, when I hear people say things like, "Oh, there were giants," "Oh, there's Nephilim," this is why it's so important to understand history and archaeology, because we're not like it, th there aren't um, there's not a paucity of evidence historically uh, and archaeologically for the late Bronze Age. So the time that Canaan is supposed to be inhabited by these huge walled cities that are ostensibly, you know, defended by these half-breed, you know, divine human giants, like we know what's going on in Canaan in this time. They're under the control of Egypt. Like firmly under the control of Egypt. There are Egyptian outposts. This is the Amarna period. 
uh, we have like we have letters from this period between the the city state kings, these little city state kings, who are bickering back and forth about the other little city state kings. And we know what's going on at this time. There aren't yeah. giants <laughs> in the land. They're yeah. not. They're not half you know half breed divine beings that are huge that need to be wiped out. Yeah. Um. So, but if you know if you know the history of the period and if you know the archaeological evidence, then all of that stuff just falls right into place. It makes sense what's going on there. And just to kind of um, reiterate my point, my point is basically what, well, the the irony of this comment is it's yeah. just dripping in irony that something that is, so I don't believe in aliens, meaning I don't believe there's alien UFO flying ships that's, you know, coming right, to right. earth or something, but the, <laughs> the possibility of the existence, yeah, no problem, the possibility of the existence of other you know, creatures that could be human-like or not human-like, doesn't matter, but the, the, the possible existence of other life forms, it's yeah. it's quite possible, it's plausible. Like you said, to the same way that we evolved, right? Even if you believe in God, maybe God created other creatures, aliens or whatever, right? Even Muslims say this. Muslims say that there's possible life on other planets because the Quran doesn't say there isn't. I mean, it would really contradict the the message of many things in the Quran will be contradicted because the Quran says, you know, all of uh, jinns and mankind is two sorts of there's angels, jinns and mankind. Jinns are these like spirits. Angels are, you know, what angels are. And jinns can be bad. If jinns are bad, the devil. So there's basically three different types of creatures. Right. And God says, Allah says, I'll fill hell with jinns and mankind. Right. So there's mm -hmm. two types of creatures. But some Muslims will say Alameen doesn't mean jinns and mankind it means all creatures and you know life forms or whatever so my point is that if you can if you're willing to believe in angel sorry like half creature demon hybrids giants and all these things simply because it's written in some book but you're claiming there's no aliens i mean to me that blows my mind that something that's possible you would reject out hand something that's completely totally unlikely probably just a, some guy wrote it in a storybook it's just a myth you right. believe in that it's just the epistemology is so wrong like that's what happens when you take dogma as a as as in a certainty like you're willing to believe the most outlandish absurd you know ridiculous things but like something that's possible aliens not saying for sure there's aliens but it's likely it possibly happen you know it could be you just throw that oh there's no evidence for alien. Oh, wow like you're <laughs> like, you know what i mean it's it's just like you've just flipped the um the point the the evidence um hierarchy there so anyways um not yeah. to go too much on that point i want to leave this comment because again i think it's so indicative of you know some of the type of viewers i have there's no problem to be an ex-muslim it's actually a good thing otherwise however with the Bible, Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. <laughs> Nobody goes to heaven except through him. This is why I have ex-Christians on my channel. Yeah. Because they like uh, that you're against Islam <laughs> and they see the harms in our current context from it. They, they've they seen Christianity has been extremely pacified compared to what it was three, 400 years ago where you could go and actually kill someone who didn't believe in the Trinity. Uh, you could burn someone at the stake legally for not believing in a Trinitarian uh, deity. Uh, but they like the idea of taking out a harmful religion like Islam. And of course, I'm on board with that as well. I want to see people start to change and start realizing what these are, including the Christ, including Jesus, including I'm consistent when I say all of these need to be equally dealt with. And I think uh, I just bought four books, by the way, on this whole thing. One of these books is 20 uh, early manuscript issues in the Quran. Because, uh, you know, they're all about inerrancy, God's actual word. And it's like, okay, we already have contradictions in the source manuscript tradition of the Quran. I do it with the Bible. I do it with everything. And we know Otangelo, by the way. Me and Dr. Josh know of Otangelo. So, um, Josh, you want to add anything to that uh, about this this comment? Or should we jump on to the next uh, example? Yeah, we, can, we can go on. Okay. So, uh, what's the next example you'd like to... A couple uh, of people, have, um, Ben in the chat has been asking about slavery. Uh, before okay. we talk about slavery, let me just let me just make a interest. Like, let me just make a point. So when it, I've heard from Christian apologists before and other Christians that you know one diff, and I and I sort of agree with this. So maybe I'm wrong. You tell me if I'm wrong. With the Quran, you have this issue that 
people believe the Quran is for all times and the Quran is prescriptive. So when the Quran says, take, you know, slaves from the captives, you know, you're, you're allowed to enslave women and children and men, and you can ransom them, you can sell them. You, if you own, you own the, the slave women, you can sleep with them. Now, of course, if you have, if you're a woman and you have a slave man, you're not allowed to sleep with him. You're not allowed to have sex with him. But the man can sleep with his female slaves, his concubines, right? Which is, which is weird. But anyways, so that was the way of life back then. And the Quran actually legalizes this. The Quran says you have to marry your, um, any woman you want to, you know, sleep with. You have to marry her except if she's your slave. So I, I always ask, well, if God really wants to eliminate slavery, because the Quran talks about freeing slaves, freeing slaves. Muslim apologists will always say, yeah, what? but the Quran says free the slaves, free the slaves. But then why didn't Muhammad insist that, because you can do this, you can marry your slave woman and make her your wife. So why wouldn't the Quran insist that you marry the woman that's your slave? She becomes, she has the full rights as a wife and then you can sleep with her. Why does it allow you to, to use these vulnerable women that really don't have a choice? I mean, there's no consent. There's no issue of consent. There's no question of consent because you own her. She has no choice in the matter. There's no, it doesn't say in the Quran, you have to ask her for permission. The, the whole concept of consent doesn't exist in the Quran. There is no consent. You, you, you own her. And even with the wife, there's a, the same sort of similar problems that a wife is not allowed to not consent to sex. And if she does, she's cursed by God and this and that. The Hadith say, it's not in the Quran, but it's, it's in the sayings of Muhammad that any wife that you know denies her husband, the angels are cursing her. The Huris, meaning the, the, the women that God created for you in paradise, are cursing her, blah, blah, blah. Um, it doesn't say you can like rape her, but it does spiritually compel her that she's a sinner and she's doing wrong and God will be mad with her and so on and so forth. But with the slaves, there's not even a question of that. There's just no concept of consent. Now, I know Muslim, some Muslim apologists will say you still need consent, but it doesn't make sense. Like imagine like uh, an ISIS fighter capturing a 13 or 16 year old Yazidi girl. But what is she going to say? No, she's going to say no to this Afghan world. No, no, it's, there's no, it doesn't even make sense. Right. Yeah. So obviously Islam, you know, the problem is many Muslims will say to this day, slavery is allowed and of course some will say no it's not but they have a harder position to argue because muhammad never forbade slavery he never eliminated he eliminated interest riba it's called riba in the quran usually mm -hmm. which of course interest is one form which is why me as a muslim i never bought a house under the mortgage because it was forbidden but slavery was never forbidden so some scholars some muslim scholars or, or, or preachers will say well god wanted to eliminate it gradually or whatever to me that's bs but that's the argument now with mm -hmm. the bible what i've heard is the bible is describing what happened back then but it's not saying you should have slaves or it's not saying you're allowed to have slaves so whoever whichever one of you wants to kind of jump in and discuss this go ahead yeah so uh it there are there are primarily three uh, passages in the law, uh, the legal sections of the Hebrew Bible and the Pentateuch that deal with slavery. And I wrote this book, Did the Old Testament Adore Slavery? Nice. Which like goes into this in detail. Um, but they are Exodus 21, which is called the Covenant Code, part of the Covenant Code, Deuteronomy 15, and uh, Leviticus 25, which is, you know, in that, in that chronological order, most scholars would say they're, uh, they, they were written in that order. Um, so there are lots of, there are lots of laws, uh, that, that sort of govern mostly governing debt slavery. Uh, but there are two types of slavery. Well, there are three types of slavery in uh, the Hebrew Bible laws of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, one is debt slavery, which is just slavery that is contingent upon a debt. So as soon as the debt is repaid, um, the person is released, slave, the, the, the slavery ends. There's chattel slavery, which is simply slavery that is not contingent upon the repayment of a debt. And then there's sex slavery. And sex slavery is, um, you know, just a, generally speaking, a woman um, is sold by her father and becomes more than likely a concubine to uh to the the owner and uh, he utilizes her for his own sexual pleasure or for and or for uh reproduction to create more slaves ostensibly um 
Now, these are not in like descriptive narrative sections. So for example, if you go to something like Judges 19, where it talks about um, the, uh, the, the Levite who has a concubine and he gives her over to be, you know, to the people of the, uh, of the town in order to be gang raped. And then she dies and he cuts her up in 12 pieces. Uh, I think a Christian apologist would rightly be able to say if, if an atheist or a skeptic said, well, look at what God commands here. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what God commanded. This is what wicked people in the period of the judges did. So I think that's fine. I think that's actually the, the, the correct way to look at that. You can't do that in these legal sections. So this is the way that the, if you're coming at this from a fundamentalist oh, hermeneutic, I see. Coming at it, then you have to be, you have to, this, the text says, thus says the Lord, or God commands, or say this to the children of Israel, uh, which is God speaking to Moses. So in that interpretation of the text, under that understanding, you have to wrestle with how is it that God is commanding these things. That's mm. that's one thing I, I just want to make a note to say, because yeah. I want you to keep going into this because slavery is a big one. I was going to bring up the final two points about child sacrifice, and, and I, we can get into that if you want to bring that back up. Just remind me, there's a couple passages that hint at this, your firstborn and all this stuff. But, um, but in that vein, Dr. Josh just said, I want to emphasize, I don't care if you want to run to the New Testament. I don't care if you want to run to Jesus to save you from the horrors of what we're discussing right now. Because even Jesus said he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. But anyway, uh, I want to make this point. Your God that you believe is the same God as the God of Jesus, who's the Father, all right, is telling people in a time when he could have said, I command you to not practice things like the nations. They're supposed to be a holy people. He clearly says this over and over, which means a separate, sanctified people, not like the other nations. But here... This is in line with all of the ancient Near Eastern stuff. This is not a shocker. If you go to any uh, institute anywhere where they don't like try to protect the Bible, they, they read it for what it says. They're actually trying to teach you. They're all going to show you. Look at the Hammurabi Code. Look at all ancient Near Eastern, Near Eastern context and how slavery was run. And everything you're reading here that Dr. Josh is talking about is found in the Bible as well. It is no different in that respect. Your God is okay with that. Are you okay that your God was okay with that? This is the question that we have. And they want to go, well, God, uh, it's the human's fault. God commands this. He could have abolished it in the in the Old Testament. They could have been so holy that they didn't even practice slavery at all. They'd have been a weird nation in the ancient Near East, and I don't know how they would have survived. But either way, God could do anything, and he didn't abolish it. P please go, Dr. Josh. I'm, I'm loving this. Can I, can I just ask a question about Dr. Josh, what you were saying about the legalistic portions. Are you saying the parts where the Bible says, you know, this is how you treat a slave? Yeah. If a slave these, runs away or this and that. Yeah. So there are, there are several legal sections. They, they show up in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and that they're basically, these are the words that God commands from either, you know, Mount Sinai, Horeb. Um, and it's the, so Exodus 21, for example, Exodus 20 is where you have the, the, the famous 10 commandments. Exodus 21 starts something called the Mishpatim, like the customs or the laws, whatever uh, it's translated. But this is like, these are this casuistic, if this, then that. Uh, so everybody wants to, like everybody wants them to be prescriptive when they say things like Exodus 21, 16, if a man uh, kidnaps another man or is found in possession of a kidnapped man, he shall be killed, right? He shall surely be put to death. Oh, well, that's prescriptive, right? That's not... <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's not describing what people did. And this is God's command. See, but then when you go five verses later and it says if a man beats his male or female slave with a wooden rod and they die immediately, then he's punished. But if he doesn't die immediately, then there is no punishment because that's that slave is his money or his property. Well, that that one's just descriptive. That's just what bad people did. That's it's like five verses apart, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, that's I want to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. I want to go into this a little bit more, but I do want to bring up one um, super chat question yeah. uh, for you guys. Ben uh, says a comment on Derek Josh's slavery read chattel, said chattel slavery never existed in Israel and was just visual thinking like Joshua's conquest. Thoughts? Yeah. So uh, two aspects to the answer here, and I love Ben. Ben is Ben is always a smart thinking. guy, man. Yeah. Um. So, so two aspects. The question of what actually took place historically 
is a separate question. This is what I was talking about earlier. Um, what ancient Israelite religion was like and what the Hebrew Bible presents it as what they want it to be. Two different questions, right? And the same thing is true with slavery. Now, that being said, um, uh, Samuel Gringus has a great article where he's looking at, uh, I think what he's comparing is uh, he's looking at the laws, some of the laws that we have in uh, the Jewish communities that were in Babylonian exile, some of the things that we see in some of the administrative and, and legal texts there, uh, which would have been, you know, like 6th century, 5th uh, century, uh, or, well, 6th century primarily here. Um, and then uh, what we see in the rabbinic law, like the rabbinic laws, the rabbinic writings that are later, and comparing them uh, to see is there consistency between those two separated by, you know, the, those, those five centuries or so. And then makes the argument that what we would have seen in Israel in uh, what we see in the Hebrew Bible probably is consistent with what came before and what came after, or what was at that time in extra biblical sources. So, yeah, I don't think there's any question that there was chattel slavery. Uh, like, I don't, I don't, I don't think there's any question at all. And, and that's consensus scholarship position. Um, wh however, however, the Hebrew Bible spins it, um, there's no question that there was chattel slavery, people owning other people, uh, and, and their release is not contingent upon repayment of the debt. Uh, but it's a great question because yeah. comparing it here to things like the conquest, we know the conquest didn't happen the way the biblical text portrays it. Archaeologically, we know it didn't happen. Neither did the um, Exodus. So if anyone right, neither did the Exodus. So this is a, a point I think I'll emphasize for Dr. Josh here is this is way over most of your audience will probably not be acquainted with this. In fact, they're starting with the Bible's true. So they can't even yeah. imagine yeah. when Josh is describing this, he's saying, like, for example, the Leviticus Holy Codes, okay? Most of this probably was not practiced in the population of Israel. These were probably priests in the temple who were like, you know, a very exclusive group they, that are saying these things. And most of Israel has an Asherah in their house or a pole out back or right. some other gods, idols in their house. And here you have this exclusive cult at the top in the temple that's saying these things. And they're the ones writing these these works yeah. that have survived, these, these uh, sources that have come down to us. That's not what all Israel was actually teaching. But what remains is what we... what. Christians have now made into scripture that that's theirs, not just Christians, Orthodox Jews and such. Um, they, they looked at this and they go, this is what it says. And this is what must be true. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of differences and stuff here, but yeah. And, and so, if I, it, but it, it, I just want to say like the book that I wrote on the old Testament did the old Testament endorse slavery. I don't, I didn't go into the new Testament uh, or into early Christianity or into the antebellum South. And putting this handbook uh, to the Old Testament together, I thought, well, I should have a chapter on slavery. So I do, but I didn't want to make it the same as the book that I wrote. So I did go into those things. And uh, because I'm seeing people in the chat talking about, oh, the New Testament, New Testament does away with the stuff in the Old Testament. So slavery, mm -hmm. you know, is no longer a thing. Well, I mean, I hate to burst your bubble, um, but the, the, like Jesus, uh, Jesus and the New Testament writers, um, they're mo many of the parables uh, of course, many of the stipulations that you see with the Apostle Paul, they all hang on the reality and the um, and the acceptance and anticipation of slavery being a real thing that continues. So Jesus, for example, uh, says, which one of you to his disciples, his apostles, which one, which ones of you who have a slave who worked in the field all day when the slave comes in would say to them here, sit down and eat with me. No, of course not, right? The way the Greek sets that up. No, of course not. You would rather say, go in and put on your like serving attire, cook me dinner, bring it out to me, wait on me while I eat, and then only after I'm done can you sit down and eat. Right? So it's 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 built upon this this uh, understanding this of uh, an acceptance and anticipation of slavery being a thing, which is what we see in the early church. In early Christianity, they don't do away with slavery, nope. right? They don't like that. It, it continues right on through, right? Because there is no condemnation of, either by Jesus or by Paul um, 
uh, in the in the New Testament. And people, they don't have to take my word for that. They can read people like Jennifer Glancy, who's written extensively on this. More recently, Ronald Charles has written a book on slavery as presented in the uh, in the New Testament in the early early church. Uh, so these are these are things. This is just consensus scholarship. This is what this is what scholars in the field say about if, this. Can I say something here, Abdullah, yep. real quick? Uh, yep. Ziggy said, uh, Derek, you know, why didn't Jesus get on a boat and uh, walk to or whatever to Mexico? If if there was a guy, Jesus, and I'll grant there was uh, for the sake of argument and say there was definitely a Jewish apocalyptic teacher in the first century. I don't think anyone in the Roman Empire knew of Mexico. So, <laughs> number one, that's just the thing. Like, And, and then number two. I have a, a, a strange way of the known world seems to be what they're concerned about. Uh, it doesn't seem like the immediate context of giving the gospel in the first century was even concerned with people like the uh, Vikings. They weren't, they weren't going to China, if that makes sense. Later, as this myth continues and the church continues, sure, proselytizing takes place in those regions. But I, I, I'm not a believer in this, so I hope that uh, answers your question. Maybe you think I brought up Jesus as if I believe in this or something. Uh, but I also think that the question is kind of like uh, irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the conversation. And then one more thing, Dr. Josh, the um, the command to kind of a command, if you will, uh, slaves, be good to your masters. Masters, you know, be good to your slaves. Uh, nowhere is it saying, guys, don't do this anymore. Yeah. None of this. And, um, and many people want to tout out something like 1 Timothy 1.10 which is, you know, it's like Galatians 3.28, 1 Timothy 1.10, the book of Philemon. These are all passive. <laughs> there you go. Um, like, it's, it's like clockwork. Yeah, um, Rilo is going to keep doing everything the apologists say, and everything the apologists go. say gets destroyed by critical scholarship. But go ahead. Yeah, so, so I, yeah. I deal with all of these passages in, in the chapter in the new book. Um, so let's take the first Timothy one ten one. you know, it talks about, uh, slave traders. So it's, it's giving a vice list and you see these in several places in the new Testament, particularly with Paul, where it says, here's a list of like really bad people, right? Really bad sins that people commit. And in one of them is, uh, is this Andropodis taste, which is this, uh, you know, it's, it's slave, a slave trade, right? Uh, and so people say, aha, like slave traders, people that are engaging in the slave trade, it's, 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 it's put in the same vice list as all these other sins. So, ah, God is doing away through the apostle Paul in first Timothy one 10 with slavery. Well, no. Um, and again, I, I won't go through all the, the details of it here. You can get the book and read about it, but, um, essentially this is a very common vice list in first century, uh, just in the first century. So it's not just Christians that are, Paul is borrowing this vice list. Right. So it, if if Paul is doing away with slavery, so is, you know, uh, other other writers uh, during this period. And let me tell you, um, the that, Roman Empire was, I think, 65 or I can't remember the percent, mostly slaves. Like they wouldn't even have stayed a nation. They would not have stayed an empire if it weren't for slavery. You think they're going to abolish the thing that keeps them going? I very much doubt it, but go ahead. What this passage is doing uh, is saying that the practice that's being talked about here is people going and stealing other people, free people, to reduce them to slavery and to sell them, right? It's not so, it, it, it would be akin to saying you can't steal cars and sell them to other people. Does that mean that you can't own cars? <laughs> no. Right. And that that's the, like, that's the parallel. It's saying you can't go steal free people and subject them to the slave trade. That's not, you can't, that's illegal. And it was illegal everywhere. It was illegal in the ancient Near East. Like it's illegal everywhere. Of course you can't, you can't steal cars and sell them to other people, it, but that doesn't mean that you can't own cars. Anyway, I won't so take up any more time. I, I, I want to um, ask about that. And then I want to highlight another comment. Uh, but before I highlight the comments, I want to ask you about that. So the, you're not allowed to kidnap free people and make them slaves. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. So where do you get slaves from? Yeah, there are lots of different ways that people can become slaves. War captives are a pretty big uh, source. Almost as big, maybe some people would argue bigger, would be uh, people that fall into debt. Uh, what? And this is, yeah, this is, this is in the ancient Near East as a whole, including the Hebrew Bible. Um, so it, let's say, uh, I take out a loan in this farming community that I'm in and I take out a loan of grain that's worth like 10 shekels of silver or something. 
um, and I have a bad year. Well, I can't repay that loan. So now I'm indebted to Derek uh, from whom I've taken this loan. Well, regular debt slavery is just as soon as I can work off that that debt to him, that amount that I borrowed from him, then I'm released. But until such time, uh, I'm kept as a debt slave. So theoretically, uh, I'm brought into his house. Well, uh, now I owe him 10 shekels of silver that I have to work off. Well, let's say I'm making a shekel a day, right? And that's a lot. But let's say I'm making a shekel a day or a shekel a month. That's more realistic of silver a month. But now, so if in 10 months, I should be able to pay this off. The problem is that now I'm also accruing interest on that loan. So I have that to pay off in addition. And then he can charge me legally things like room and board, right? He can, so he, now what ends up happening in regular debt servitude is that the, the interest and the accruing debt becomes so significant that I can't ever work it off. So this is why in the ancient Near Eastern law codes and, and in ancient Near Eastern um, edicts, you see kings saying, to all the citizens of this land, I declare andoraro, which is uh, freedom. And, and it's freedom from debt servitude, it's freedom from loans, because these things would build up and people would just stay in debt servitude. They'd never get out, so they just declare freedom. And this is what we see in the law code of Hammurabi. In order to get like away from this, you know, the debt builds up, interest, and all that stuff. They say if somebody becomes a slave, a debt slave to you, they can serve three years, and in the fourth year you set them free. Their debt is paid for, no matter what it was, no matter what accrues with it, anything else you charge. Three years and they're done. In the Hebrew Bible, it's six years, right? They serve for six years. They're released oh, wow. in the seventh. Um. So like the so but those people that's one of the ways that they fall into slavery. Now in Leviticus 25 44 to 46 we see that foreign slaves are not subjected to this release after a set period of time. What the text says is as for your male and female slaves whom you'll have you can get them from the nations around you, you can also get them from the tenant farmers that are in your midst. It doesn't specify how that's happening but it's probably a you know a conjunction of you're either going into a foreign land and you've got somebody who's already a slave and you purchase them, uh, you get a war captive like you see in Deuteronomy 20, mm -hmm. uh, or you have somebody who's a tenant farmer, a foreign tenant farmer in the land, and they fall into debt servitude and they come in and, and those people are not released, right? They're not subject to this, either the seven year, seventh year release or the 50th year release, the Jubilee. They can, they can be kept as permanent property. They become a chuzah, which is the Hebrew term for that. Uh, they serve you for life. Uh, they're passed on as inheritance along with their children. Like these are chattel slaves. So there are several ways that you can become. And again, I go into all of them in, in the book, but um, it's pretty and, common. Uh, something about whole slavery thing, and you mentioned this in the book, is about the, um, the beating of the slaves, which we've mentioned yeah. this before how you know that they're not on the same playing field. A lot of apologists like to use and try to pretend. Oh, well, you couldn't be, you couldn't just like you couldn't hurt a free citizen of whatever. You can't do that to a slave. They're equal. No, they're not. They're definitely, they're definitely a different class. Yeah, yeah. They're definitely not treated the same. And this is in the Bible, right? I say that to say, we know from like American history, not too long ago, uh, me and Dr. Josh, we did some in-person inter interviews because I actually drove to his house. He's five hours from me. We did a lot of in-persons. We talked about, um, we talked about the, the South, the Annabelle of South slavery in America and how that in the law codes of the South, they're using the Bible to point out stuff like, okay, uh, slaves be good to your, or, or masters be good to your slaves. Like don't, you, you know, if you kill your slave uh, right out the gate from abusing them, you've overdone your, you're going to get in trouble period. But if uh, you beat the crap out of them and whatnot and they don't die, it's okay. Like there's, you're supposed to beat your slaves. And uh, was it Proverbs talks about this as well? Like, yeah, Proverbs 29, 19 to 21. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's and, an and ugly picture. The, the, the thing that I think Derek is, is driving at here is that the legal rationale that you see in the Hebrew Bible is there's a tension and the tension is masters have to be able to beat their slaves. They have to be able to do corporal punishment because how else will you motivate them? That's what Proverbs 29 talks about, uh, amongst other things. And the same was true with kids, right? Uh, it, it, if you love your son, you beat him with a wooden rod. Like this is like this is the, the mentality. So what they're wrestling with um, 
is how do we uh, continue to allow masters to be able to beat their slaves for it with moderate correction in order to motivate them, in order to correct them, figure out a line, whatever. But we don't want them. We don't want the slaves abused or murdered. How do we? What's? How do we reconcile that and keep that tension? Uh, keep a law that has a healthy tension there. And so what they do is they say, all right, look, if you beat a slave and he dies immediately, it's clear that you were doing more than just moderately correcting them. Mm -hmm. So then you're punished as if you killed a free person, right? How, which is so. However, if they last, like if they survive a day or two and then die, well, then the benefit of the doubt is given to the, the slave master. Maybe there was something intervening that caused the death. And so there is no punishment because it was assumed that you were just doing moderate correction. Well, that same legal tension, that rationale that you see in the Hebrew Bible is what you see in the antebellum South. So judges are wrestling with the same thing and they come up with a very similar solution. You got to be able to beat them. So if there's moderate correction and they die, well, that was just moderate correction. It's not the master's fault. But if they abuse the, the slave or they murder the slave and that's proven, then it's the penalty is as if you killed a free white person. So and when just it, perspective, yeah. I have yeah. to give this perspective. When you're looking at the slavery that was done to African-American people two, three hundred years ago, uh, do you think they had great rights and do you think that they were treated properly? And I'm using this in a sense. It's not Xerox exact copy of what I'm saying is going on in the ancient world. We don't know how horrible it may have been in the ancient world. We have very good reality of how slavery was in America 300 years ago. And if you look at that and you go, that's horrible. No one should own a human and be able to beat them and to do with them as they want, as if they're cattle. They're their property. They can sell them if they want. They could do whatever. It's their property. You look at the Old Testament and you realize, hold on, the white men in the South were using the Bible as their rule book as part of this whole practice. Of course, they were looking, most of the stuff's clearly written in the Old Testament, but then they, they were justified. These weren't just Old Testament practicing people. These were Bible-believing Christians all right, who are using the New Testament. Now, not all slave owners were bad in the same sense. This is kind of how the system worked. But all of us would agree this is a horrible thing, yeah. and we should abolish it completely. Why didn't God see that? Why didn't God just say, okay, here's the deal. Owning humans is as bad as, like, he's abolishing that like he's abolishing infant sacrifice, or he's abolishing all these other bad practices that they say are bad. Why does he abolish it? And, and so, yeah. yeah, there's so much. Wow, there's so much good stuff coming <laughs> out from you two guys on this topic. I just want to pause for a moment and quickly uh, thank Mohammed from Egypt. Uh, shukran for your uh, super chat, uh, Mohammed. Uh, I, if you guys know, I was in Egypt for a few months. Lovely place. Um, there's another super chat question for you guys. Before I get to that, I just want to make a few quick comments because this thing is going so fast. There's so much going on here. So much d good discussion. Um, what I wanted to say, first of all, was um, regarding the historical versus the mythical, um, that discussion about, you know, that is so true that most of this would go over people's heads because the way you see the world for Muslims and maybe Christians, it's the same thing. You, you've, you've bought into the myth so strongly that Muhammad did this and said this and this is what happened. Um, you know, so when someone comes and brings a historical challenge to that, you know, did the Jews really wander for 40 days? Or what was it? 40 days? Four months? In 40, the, years. 40, 40 years. 40 years. <laughs> okay, that's even worse. Now, now you're like, okay, wait, that's like someone's challenging you. you. You have to really stop and question. And I think for most people, it's very difficult to get to that point because it's a next level of analysis, right? And once you get to that point, of course, the whole thing falls apart because now you you realize that uh, like this thing does, is not historically accurate. So how could it be from God? And same thing with the with the Quran. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was um, about the the sources of slavery. How the reason I found that so interesting is because in Islam as well, um, Muhammad also made the same restriction that many Muslims even don't know this that you're not allowed to kidnap free people and make them slaves, but you are allowed to buy and sell slaves. 
So you can you you have you're allowed to get world captives. World captives are the majority of. I didn't know about the debt slaves. That's interesting. I'm curious if Islam allows that type of slavery too. My guess is probably yes. Yeah, I would. Um, see. I don't see why they wouldn't allow that. Yeah. And and the question I had for you when you brought up the law of Hammurabi, um, actually one more thing. One more thing I wanted to because this. Oh my God. This. You got so a couple much, super chats. Go ahead and get those up. So oh so much. This thing is gone. Is going so quickly that we can't. I can't even keep again. up. So one of the comments, one of the comments I wanted to uh, highlight, which I might have lost it now, is Rilo was saying, uh, "Why, uh, why don't your guests bring up references?" And I wanted to highlight that because it's so funny that you guys are bringing up the references before he's even putting them. Like you're actually, you already know all the references, <laughs> and you know the counters too. Like, yeah, you know they're gonna quote Timothy, whatever, and then. In the chat, it's like Timothy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. of course, you have references. Like, we don't have time to read, you know, Doctor Josh's whole book right now. <laughs> if you want, I can <laughs> start right now. Yeah. We don't have time. We don't Seth have time. already did that. Sorry. Yeah, we, like the the point of this conversation is not to exhaustively list every single reference because that'll be boring like we like yeah. most people don't need to don't need that level of this is not that type of conversation we're just doing very high level you know quick fire rapid fire whatever you want to call it Get, going through some of the points and for people that are interested you know these are the references th this is the you can look you can get the book you can get the book yeah. you can go into more detail on it but for I the majority with, of people uh, like i did just so rilo i deal pretty extensively with the book of Galatians. <laughs> the big verse that you want to talk about it is Galatians 3.28. I see you there, Galatians 5.1. There's but neither you have free to, nor slave nor male yeah. nor female. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to, what Paul is dealing with is the spiritual aspect of someone who is in Christ. Yep. But, yep. okay. Because he, in, in Galatians, let's go ahead and get this clear, is seeing the Torah, the circumcision as a restriction, as some type of stumbling block that is causing you to not be in Christ. There's this problem with the, the people who are opposing the Galatian church are trying to enforce on the Galatians as well as its other audience to be circumcised, to be part of Christ. And he's saying, no, before the law, before Torah, Abraham was righteous by believing, having faith. He wasn't even circumcised yet. So his whole point is circumcision is, in a sense, a metaphorical slavery to these people who don't need it. It's irrelevant. And then in chapter 5, he says, cut the whole thing off. If you're going to circumcise the tip, and this is literally coming from Paul, cut what? your whole penis off. That's Paul's <laughs> argument. He's so upset in Galatians. So anyway, we can get into that in a whole different. But uh, do you know the context, Derek? That's I have no problem. clue what I'm talking about. I have no clue, <laughs> and I'm not even bringing up references. <laughs> and by the way, I do appreciate Ry Rilo Rilo. I do, too. I, I do appreciate yeah. this this sort of healthy dialogue because this is what we want. Like we want yeah. this. Of course, we're not going to be. It's not. This is not a live debate, like so to speak. Like we're not going to be like, okay, we're going to respond to every single comment. It's fun. It's fun. But it it is it is you know it's good to kind of you know do you know, pick and choose which comments we can respond to because there's not, there's not time to go through all of them. Um, so here's another super chat. So we'll, we'll, this is probably the last question because we've gone on um, almost for two hours now. So Dr. Josh, were there not special rules for the debt slaves if they have family while in slavery? So real quick, I, I yeah. suspect what he's referring to is Exodus 21, two to six. Yeah. And I go into that in the book yeah, and in, in all the of the book. Um, but basically, it, it, the way that the, the, the law sets this up is if a fellow Israelite takes another Israelite as a slave, purchase him, purchases, ugh, purchases him as a slave, he keeps him for six years, releases him in the seventh. Then it breaks down different situations. If that male slave comes into debt slavery single, after six years when he leaves, he leaves single. If he comes in with a wife, so he's married and then he falls into debt slavery. He, he comes in with his wife and he leaves with his wife. Then it sets up if he comes in single, but his master gives him uh, an, another a female slave as a wife and they have sons and daughters. After the six years, that male slave goes out free. If he exercises his right to freedom, he goes out. But the wife and the children of that marriage uh, are the master's property. They stay with the master. So then the text says, well, what if the, you know, what if the husband and the father then says, well, I want to stay with, you know, my wife and my kids, what do I do? Well, then he becomes a permanent, he becomes a chattel slave to that master. 
So that those are the those are the stipulations that you see. Um, yeah, and Islam, the, I think Islam, I think it's even worse than that because you can separate. You know, there's no rule that a husband and wife, once even if you're married, once you take a slave, she's no longer mm -hmm. married to her husband. She becomes like your property and you can split them up. You can there's no rules. I have heard one Muslim scholar mention all of these rules. Um, you know, you can't do this, you can't I have no idea where he came up with these rules because the hadith, the the, the rulings of Muhammad didn't say anything like there's no rules like this. In fact, you see in the Quran and the Sira, the life of Muhammad, that the 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 non the muslim followers of muhammad his companions they were even troubled by the fact that they're allowed to sleep with the with this woman that's actually married to someone else his, his slave mm -hmm. and so they asked muhammad about it they're like like can we do this like she's met and and Quran says there's no harm she's now your property and you don't have to feel any guilt so you know this is kind of one of the worst parts of of religious dogma is when you take it at such a level that you know, you you believe God is allowing you to do these things. And this is, I think the reason why we're bringing this up and we're emphasizing this is just to show people that how is this a source of, you know, absolute or objective or even, you know, morality? Like, where's the morality in this? You know, if you take this as, as a source of morality, what type of world would we live in? Like you said, the yeah. early church fathers, they had no problem with slavery. And that's bizarre to, I think, many modern christians would would have a problem with that would they not because from their perspective oh jesus is all about freeing slaves right kind of like muslims it, it, real quick i wanted to say something in light of this whole there's neither male nor uh female that context i do think he's mentioning slaves as actual slaves right uh but he's talking about classes and paul's entire point isn't you're not a slave anymore no he's right. saying whether you're a female whether you're a male whether you're a slave, whether you're free, whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Gentile, it doesn't matter in Christ. We are all one in the body of Christ. He's not abolishing slavery. He's not saying, That's well, right. listen, if you think you're free, you're not really free anymore either, by the way. I mean, and if you like, think you're a slave, you're not a slave. Yeah. Carry, carry it further. Like if, if what that text is saying in Galatians 3.28 is that there are no more slaves or free people, right? Everybody's the same and that there's no role distinction or societal distinction. Would Paul say that there is no role distinction or societal distinction between men and women? No, I mean, because read he first says Corinthians clearly, 14 and tell exactly. me he does. Yeah. Yeah. He tells, no. he tells them that Dr. Josh, that's so clear. Yeah. He's like, look, women be silent. Let your husbands teach you. Well, I thought we're on the same playing field now. I'm not yeah. really your, I'm not really under you in, in some class sense. I'm not really, why would I need to be taught by you? In fact, I'm on the equal playing field. And so technically yeah. this whole women be silent and don't teach, let me, you know, your husbands teach you. Well, remember what Paul said in Galatians three, yeah. shut your mouth. Cause Paul said this nice try. It doesn't work. It, right. It's 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 a faith thing. That's not and, what the text is doing. This is right. It's who who are we in Christ? Right. That we've all been justified. We've all been you know sanctified, and we're moving toward this this uh, spiritual sanctification here on earth. And so everybody is spiritually on the same playing field, right? So that you can't say, oh, I'm better than you uh, in, in in Christ, and you're less than me. We're all in Christ on the same playing field before God in his eyes, but that doesn't then carry over into uh, societal roles and norms. I mean, Paul is carrying those through. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, what, one thing I, I was going to say yeah, in this is right. where they might run to stuff like, and this is kind of silly. I understand why they would do that after hearing something so blatant about slavery, but he came to set the captives free, Dr. Josh. How how could you say that he didn't abolish slavery when Jesus came to set the captives free? I mean, Hammurabi came to set the captives free, and he does. It's in the prologue. I mean, it's what he does to, to make sure that the oppressed aren't oppressed, to make sure that the poor aren't oppressed. That that you know, I mean, God, we see this in the third millennium with Urukagina. You know, he says that the, the guy with 60 shekels doesn't oppress the guy with 10 shekels. I mean, that's the whole point. That's what kings do. This is an ancient Near Eastern thing. That doesn't mean that there's no slavery. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, but before we do that, um, just want to leave this one comment, just to be fair. Some church fathers did have a problem with slavery, though, in fact, the first person to be abso absolutely against slavery was J uh, Gregory of Gregory Nista. Nista. Do you guys know about this? Yeah, so some of the early church uh, fathers uh, had problems with slavery 
uh, Chrysostom, I think, was another one. Oftentimes, the problems that they had were not about slavery itself. Although I don't, I'm, this is not my field. Like yeah. Early church history is not my thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I would I would recommend that L four and anybody else go read um, Jennifer Glancy uh, on her her work on early Christianity and slavery. But the, a lot of times, the problem that was had in those first three or four centuries were about like things like gluttony. Like you shouldn't have so many slaves <laughs> because you know you're just like it's like having ten yeah. pairs of shoes. You don't need that many, right? It's not you shouldn't own people as property. And and the thing is, I would ask, why didn't they all have problems with this? Why some? Shouldn't it be clear from the divine text? I mean, I think, you know, to be honest, I think we humans have evolved. Our morality has improved. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we see human beings as having more dignity today. And women, children, we they, they have women, children, and even like, like all humans have more rights and more dignity today and more honor in the eyes of other humans than ever before. We don't take, you know, we, the reason we have a problem with slavery today is because we've evolved. We've improved our, our morality. Whereas back then, it's like, yeah, this guy is a different color skin. I can, you know, there's no harm in having him as a slave or, you know, genocide is okay. Be from with These people is different. War, you know, uh, conquer. All of these things are okay. Whereas now we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we fought for that after the World War II. We, you know, we, we define this contract that, all humans, no matter the sex, religion, gender, no matter what, we treat everybody with the same rights, right? And there was a comment, which I've now missed it because this conversation is going so fast about, you know, how, how come humanists are mocking other, you know, if you, what's, is this what humanism is about? And f humanism, in my perspective, and you guys can feel free to respond to this as well, is about treating people with rights you know not discriminating others based on the so if someone's christian they have the same rights as an atheist as a muslim we don't discriminate someone based on the way they dress or about the sexuality or anything now ideas you know holy books or not so holy books they're all fair game like how is it that someone can ex can you know cheer me on for for complaining about the quran and saying the quran's bad for humanity and it has all these terrible things Whereas now you're saying these guys should, you know, how dare they, these humanists talk about the Bible? You know, is this what humanism is about? It's kind of like, well, why are you here on my channel then? You like what I do, but you don't like what they're doing. Whereas these are all just ideas. These are all ideologies. And these things matter because they influence people's actions and the way they live their lives and the way that they treat others. I mean, for example, how certain people treat gays in the Muslim world is very, very bad because of the religious teachings and for no other reason right uh and thank you Za Za Munira, for the super super stickers uh you guys want to respond to that and and just so we're gonna wrap it up now uh i want to give you guys your chance to say your final words do check out myth vision the channel subscribe it's down there check out dr josh's channel uh digital hammurabi Oh, sorry, before you do your final comments, I want to ask you, Dr. Josh, because I think there's a very important reason for this. Why did you call your channel Digital Hammurabi? What, what is it? Who is Hammurabi and why is he so important? Yeah, Hammurabi was the king uh, of the old Babylonian period, the first dynasty of Babylon. Uh, he ruled right around the middle of the 18th century. And I mean, he's incredibly important because, uh, first of all, because he's one of the more famous kings. Uh, and that's probably uh, one of the, the the bigger motivations for utilizing him. And we we could have called it digital shulgi or something, but <laughs> uh, not many people know shulgi. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Hammurabi is one of the. You know, he establishes that first dynasty at Babylon. Uh, of course, he has the incredibly famous law code of Hammurabi, or the law collection of Hammurabi. Uh, so he's very well known. And of course, those uh, things that he um, and, and that law code influence sometimes people argue directly uh, things that we see in the biblical law codes or the law, law collections. So, I mean, highly influential. He was one of the first centralizing uh, people in the second millennium, centralizing kings. I mean, he did some pretty cool stuff. But uh, yeah, I just, I, we really liked him. Actually, it was Megan's idea uh, because she, she, uh, and what we're trying to do with digital and Hammurabi is trying to bring the ancient Near East and the digital humanities, you know, sort of together in our channel so that somebody who uh, wants to know about the ancient world and is well versed in, in you know, like we, most of us are in the digital age, uh, can, can find application 
uh, and accessibility to something ancient like Hammurabi. Yeah, and this comment is actually getting to the point I was trying to make, which was basic moral concepts and codes are ubiquitous and found across many cultures. They're no more exclusive to Christianity than they are to modern philosophy. Don't a lot of Christians make these claims that Jesus is the, the first one who came up with the golden rule? And, and so the codes of Hammurabi and others are actually big counterexamples to this, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, there are definitely things that uh, I would say that the most useful thing about these ancient law collections, like the laws of Ornamu, or even the, the older laws of Urukagina, or Lipid Ishtar, or Ashnuna, Middle Syrian laws, New Babylonian laws, and of course the laws of Hammurabi, any of these things, um, is that they show that, amongst other things, there is sort of a, a, a broad legal, common legal tradition and a legal rationale that stands behind these cultures in the ancient Near East. And people like Raymond Westbrook have been arguing this stuff for a while. Um, you know, more recently, somebody like Bruce Wells down at University of Texas, Austin, has written pretty extensively about this. Um, but the, the bigger thing is that as a fundamentalist evangelical, I was just under the impression that the Hebrew Bible or the Bible in general is this created in a vacuum, handed down by God text. And of course, it's not the case. So when you see things uh, like, oh my gosh, the flood story that's in Genesis 6 through 9 goes back uh, to the early second millennium and, and the biblical writers are utilizing it and polemicizing it, um, that's a big deal. And it's something that we all need to, to understand. And I think that fundamentalist evangelicals need to wrestle with. You know, I honestly have truly loved this conversation. It's been so intense and fast paced and I can't even keep up with all of the things I want to ask you guys and kind of elaborate on. Like even just now, you said a bunch of things I would love to really dig into. So we're going to have to do this again for sure at Absolutely. some point. Uh, thank you, Derek, for for coordinating and, and bringing Dr. Josh on as well. I want to have you on as well another time to speak more to, to your story. This has yeah. been an amazing conversation. So the last word goes to you guys first, Derek, and then Dr. Josh, to plug your uh, plug what you do, your channel. Where can people find you? Where can they support you? And um, you know, let's 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 uh, you guys get the final word. Okay, um, what I obviously being a fundamentalist Christian who used to believe very much like Rilo and would have been in the text, I would have been chatting in the comment section with <laughs> scripture verses, going, "That's not true. That's not true." Over and over. Um, eventually, when I was able to be critical of my own position and i actually said what do experts say in the field and why and listen to both sides um i started to go okay we have problems here what i believe in the way i believe it um it doesn't match the reality of the current con the original context to these texts how i want to apply these things in my own life i'm glad that people aren't using them the way they originally are meant good i'm glad but i want them to to know like if you think you're going to go around slamming the book on people if you hand this book to someone and they're by themselves reading this text and you're not over here telling them how to view it, uh, they might run away like you talk about ISIS on your channel. OK, ISIS is claiming to read the Quran for what the Quran actually says, not what the smileys want to say. It says not what, you know, the Sunni want to say. It says they say the text says and now they're cutting heads off of people. Why? Because in its original context, people's heads came off. Okay, okay, so they're really trying to be authentic to the text itself. Well, guess what? If you do that with the Bible, you might end up with some ugly situations. You might have Christians on street corners holding up homosexuals will burn in hell and God hates fags. And I'm talking about like legit hate speech. Why? Well, you can see where particular law codes literally command the death of a man who lays in the bed with another man, depending on the context where you're looking, but in the Old Testament— or you might find places where they go, well, Jesus is all about love and God doesn't hate anyone. Well, Psalms 5.5 5 disagrees with you, my friend. And so does Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Okay, there are clear passages that teach these ideas. If you want to paint them over as pretty, be my guest. But you're not actually representing what they originally meant. And I want to do that. I have experts on the channel. Come subscribe. Dr. Josh is one of them. And we're, we're poking holes at ancient texts to see what they say. 
You open up a whole can of worms there with those. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's so worms. much. There's so I just want to ask one quick thing then. I don't, I don't want to go for too long, but just quickly, I want to ask one quick thing. How is it that, you know, according, if Jesus, you know, fulfilled the letter of the law, there's no more sacrifice, um, you can eat pig, you know, why Why is homosexuality still forbidden? Like, isn't that a law, old law, like from Leviticus or whatever? Deuteronomy? Paul, Paul seems to come after Jesus' death and resurrection. He's preaching. And if one interprets, and I think Paul might be hinting at this in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, men with men working, working that which is unseemly, burned in their lust one toward another as women who pretty much neglect the natural use of the body to be with women. And then he goes into this list of things. They're God-haters. They're reprobates, right? Um, it's clear that Paul still holds that this sexual immorality is still a thing, even though oh. it's death abolishes the law, uh, the law according to Paul. Okay. And, and I so see. He, there's still morality. Like it's like just because a law's gone doesn't mean there's no morality, and then antinomianism is the case. So no, Paul doesn't seem to be antinomian. He still thinks you, you're supposed to live a life that is uh, uh, holy in some sense. You know, you're supposed to represent okay. Christ. You know, and okay. So the difference then with Islam is that Islam's, you know, many Muslims would believe you it's, you're still. The law to kill homosexuals still applies to this day. Not for like not vigilante style, but in a state, a state, if there was evidence and there was whatever witnesses, they would be executed. The same way an adulterer would be executed if there was evidence of adultery, three witnesses of penetration or whatever. Uh, but that's that would be a difference then with Christianity. But you, but you're saying it still inspires people to hate gays, which is unfortunately still part of christianity right i mean not not none i won't I, let me not paint a broad stroke okay. i'm saying okay. literalist i'm saying okay, people okay. Got it. who can't divorce oh, context okay. and the like reality ISIS. like isis like look, okay. dr josh's wife yeah she reads these texts and, and and they nourish her in a different way than someone who reads them and goes paul said it's an abomination it's an abomination and there's people running around throwing the bible at people forcing them to say but christ loves you but if you don't believe in him he's gonna cook you in this eternal place that god created forever but he loves you like i mean like i, I took that from the comedian the stand-up he's like <laughs> you know he's like talking yeah. like and god loves you so much and uh but if you don't believe he's gonna burn you and cook yeah. you and torture you and da, 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 da. <laughs> but he loves you and yeah. it's like uh well at least yeah. with islam there's no like they don't, they don't even pretend like Allah loves you. It's just like you just yeah. submit. <laughs> yes, he loves, you know, if you if you submit, he loves you. Otherwise, no, nope, he doesn't love you. <laughs> All right, Dr. Josh, uh, final words to you. And uh, if you want to plug your, your latest book as well, you know, definitely do that. And your channel or whatever you want, go, go for it. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you having us on. Um, I guess what I would say is that the, the point of our channel, when we when we delve into these things and the point of the books, um, is is for somebody like the individuals that are in the side chat, some of them uh, who are very much uh, convinced by this this fundamentalist approach, this literalistic uh, interpretation of the biblical text, to be able to take a step back and to look at things in a different light. And I I noticed a comment. I can't remember who said it, but I suspect it's the same guy who said like these people probably don't even know the gospel. And I wouldn't do this normally. But, you know, I was, a, I was a fundamentalist evangelical Christian for 26 years. And the gospel that I understood was that uh, I'm a sinner, right? And that uh, the, the sin that I do is born from my sin nature that I received in Adam. Uh, and that nothing that I could do in this life, no works that I could perform, uh, would absolve me of those sins or somehow pay for those sins. And because of those sins, uh, in the eyes of a righteous and holy God, uh, I was unfit to be in heaven with him, and that sin needed to be punished, and that punishment took the form of uh, a, a, an eternity in hell separated from him, the second death. Uh, and so I was without hope, but because Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life as the Son of God, being God in the flesh, uh, and died on the cross, he paid the penalty for my sins, and in doing so, he uh, made the very righteousness of God available to me. And by simply believing, not by working, but by faith, uh, by grace through faith, I could be um, justified in His sight, and uh, and that 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 salvation as a free gift could be uh, was afforded to me, and that I could then uh, go to heaven and, and live with Him for eternity. That didn't mean that I would be perfect here on this earth; that I would work out my sanctification, trying to bring who I was in line uh, with the the actions that I performed. 
So yeah, I understand the gospel. Um, and so I want you to know that coming from that position uh, as that individual, I have stepped out of that, right? And, and that's okay. And so the point of this book is not to try to, again, my wife is a Christian. It's not to try to get people to not be Christians anymore, but it's so that we all start on the same footing, that we all have the same data points that we're working with so that we're not coming to things like slavery and trying to defend it like in a way that will, un, un, I think, unfortunately, if we continue to do it, ultimately lead to another round of slavery uh, in, in our modern culture. So, um, yeah, I think so. So get the book. If you doubt what I'm saying, it's absolutely fine. Um, Can I, I say something, uh, Josh? I mean, literally, I got to make a joke, dude. Riley, like Rilo, I can't. Like while you were saying the gospel, the, the one thing that comes. This is just the point. Nothing will make him happy from our lips. There's nothing you could say. It doesn't matter if you tote every word you can quote John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, okay? I, just, I had to quote that to get extra Halloween can, candy on October the 31st <laughs> at many of the houses in my own neighborhood. I'm not kidding. What? And when I would, they said you could yep. take two hands, not one, like all the other kids. <laughs> if you can quote that verse, you can take both <laughs> hands and you get as much candy as you want. It's amazing how much like you can say the gospel but you I didn't know. quote you didn't quote a bible verse and you didn't say john 3 16 and you didn't actually say get out of here with that and another thing ziggy look i'm already dating someone you can get off my you know what okay <laughs> so anyways <laughs> yeah no uh yeah um so dr josh so so yeah well, i do recommend everyone check out your book and digital hammurabi that's uh where, and where's the best place to find you guys i guess twitter yeah, I'm on Twitter, uh, DJ Hammurabi one. I think if you just go to Amazon and type in Joshua Bowen, all of our the books and the links and all that stuff, I think you can probably find it all there. I awesome, can't tell awesome. You guys, this is the best book right now out. I'm not even kidding that. you. He's working on volume two. Uh, it's on Audible too. If you for some reason can't read like papers, difficult for you guys to read, there's a wonderful man who actually reads it. And he was he was a news anchor. Uh, Seth Andrews was a oh, news nice. anchor, so his voice is that kind of like angelic, deep. And then, oh, you uh, got you know, like, Seth Andrews to lead it. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Yes. He, he volunteered. Oh, he sweet. offered. Yeah, nice. That's, that's amazing. Um, all right, so that's the end of it, guys. Uh, thank you for your time. Honestly, you know, it went the two hours just went like that. Like I thought, you know, one hour and ninety minutes will be the cutoff, but it just boom it's just like you know i i think we could have gone for like four hours with all of the knowledge and you know perspective that you're bringing to this channel and you know there's a good turnout as well um i do want to recommend again everyone uh who is not subscribed this is my new channel friend the ex-muslim the old channel had a lot more subscribers but i lost a lot uh with the demonetization so please do mm -hmm. subscribe to the new channel uh so i can get back to sixty thousand and even more than that i'm i'm hoping to keep keep this going uh thank you everyone who made a super chat thank you all my patrons thank you to the mods beach john uh everyone else that's in there as well I, I i'm not gonna be able to mention everyone's name but the uh but thank you everyone and uh we'll we'll have another one soon it'll be great we'll we'll talk about something else um and do check out the the guest channels as well and uh, appreciate all you guys and girls and um stay safe and um take care bye <laughs>